Welcome. You guys having a great build? Yeah, yeah, okay, let's have some energy here. Hey, so we got Chevron with us today. Chevron is coming up on their 140th anniversary, 140 years. So here's the deal, when you got a company that's been around 140 years, that's a company that can navigate some twists and turns, okay? And once again, Chevron's navigating a big shift, and that shift is digital transformation. And so we're lucky enough to have Victoria Harris with us here. Victoria is uh, what Chevron calls the cloud lady. And her responsibility, get this, get this, her responsibility is to take 6,000, that's right, 6,000 applications and move them to the cloud. So she's going to tell you how she's going to do that. And uh, joining her, I've got Ryan Ramsharan. He's from Microsoft with our Azure um, adoption team. And uh, there you go. All right, perfect. give him a warm welcome. All right, thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, so my name is Ryan Ramsharan. I'm with a team we call Azure Customer Advisory, or better known as Azure Cat. And so. Who am I and what do I do? So uh, about six months ago, you might have read in the news that Microsoft formed a partnership uh, with Chevron. And so what does that partnership really mean? Well, it means a commitment to the platform, and by platform, primarily Azure, um, across a number of different facets. So that's everything from OMS and the operations management suite to analytics to enterprise integration. And so for that commitment, and this partnership that we're building, our engineering team said, hey, look, you know, we want to be in the, in the trenches as they migrate, as they adopt a lot of these technologies. So we're going to park you, meaning me, out there and make sure that as Chevron adopts these technologies, we are ensuring that our, the feedback is driven into our product teams to ensure that we're meeting or exceeding, you know, the solutions that uh, we're, we're being asked to provide. And so... Uh, for this Azure First commitment, again, there's myself and a number of architects that are spend our day living out at Chevron, working with them across this uh, digital transformation journey. And so, Jeffrey mentioned there's about 6,000 applications that we're moving, but that's just on the migration side. Um, it's also a number of greenfield applications across, again, things like analytics, uh, so, you know, leveraging products that are coming out to do interactive queries and uh, all of that stuff, and as well, we've got also things like enterprise integration, right? So service bus, logic apps, building enterprise integration for all of the transactions that run through all of the ERP systems, et cetera. So it's a, it's a big commitment, and again, what we're there to do is help them uh, as they architect these things, and then again, provide the feedback into our engineering teams. So with that, I'll turn it over to Vicki. Thank you, Ryan. You can give that one back to Jeffrey. Uh, so for all of you here, this was a 45 minute session, so you're in a 75 minute block, so we don't have 60 minutes of slides, so that's lucky for you. Uh, but you do have my commitment, I will stay here the whole time to answer any and all questions that you have full 75 minutes. So uh, we do want to keep the presentation short. Uh, this is a very broad topic and the questions can come from all sorts of places. And so I'm going to touch on um, things from billing to DevOps and things like that. So I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, with that, I know I have a funny title, Public Cloud Manager, Chevron calls everyone a manager. Uh, I did start this journey about two and a half years ago, I think with one employee. Uh, I have completely lost track of how many I have now. I think we just on our Agile teams alone, we've got one, uh, 150. Uh, so we grew pretty quickly, uh, which is a difficult thing to do in an organization of our size, uh, but it's testament to the speed at which we wanted to move and some of the early successes we've had in being able to move at speed. Um, so I'm just really going to talk very briefly about Chevron to give you an overview, which gives you an idea of some of the challenges we're facing. Uh, <laughs> Jeffrey, we don't like to, I don't like to remember that we're 140 years old, but uh, we do have a lot of legacy technology, uh, and so there's a lot of good and bad history there in terms of what we have to overcome. Uh, and really mostly what we learned, uh, because we've been moving very quickly, uh, we have a lot of good learnings. Some things were easier and some things were harder. Uh, with that, just a little bit about Chevron. 
Uh, we are a global energy company uh, operating in over 30 countries around the world. Uh, we have over 50,000 employees. Uh, we also have a lot of joint ventures and strategic partnerships. So on any given day, uh, there's over 150,000 people working around the world uh, in the name of Chevron. And our main goal is to make sure those people are safe every day. Uh, for IT, we have about 4,000 IT employees and they're globally distributed as, distributed as well. Uh, and so those folks are supporting our business units. Uh, and as Jeffrey mentioned, we have 6,000 applications, anything from an HR application uh, to something that's looking for a crack in a pipeline uh, to something that's managing the liquefaction of natural gas uh, to a basic finance application. Basically, whatever it is, we've got an app for that. <laughs> We've got to move it. Um, but it, it also creates some challenges in the distributed nature of our workforce. If you can imagine, all these local solutions are great for the business. They add value. Uh, but if you're looking to move into the modern world where everything is automated and you have no base of standardization uh, and you do not have very many common processes, that is a tremendous challenge. So where we started with some of these challenges. Uh, we do have a very strong safety culture, strong reliability culture, uh, which means we can check once, we can check something twice, we're really good at checking stuff, we might check it 15 times. It means we're highly, highly reliable. It also means we're not very nimble, we're not agile, uh, and we do not deploy code to production very quickly. Uh, so. Also, that's a mental challenge or a culture challenge when you're getting, trying to get people to do something differently. And they say, I have all these manual check, check, check processes telling them, no, a machine can do that and it's all gonna be fine and it will be highly reliable. Uh, sometimes they don't believe you. And so proving to them that it can be more reliable uh, is also a challenge. Um, but that's critical, that's a mental hurdle to get over. Uh, is the cloud secure? Is it reliable? We certainly had to prove both of those things uh, to help our business partners understand. Um, also early on, we had high demand, uh, but the demand is, I don't really know what I want, but I know I want cloud and I want it tomorrow. Um, so we have a change management challenge on our hands, uh, which is that people are asking for capabilities where they don't understand how they work. Uh, and the mental model that they have is their legacy technology. And so sometimes they don't even ask the right questions. Just say, I need that and I need it tomorrow. Uh, so sometimes you have to just walk them back and really try to educate them. Uh, that's a tremendous challenge as well. Uh, fixed legacy costs and technical debt. Um, if you're only looking at a project, I mean, I saw it 100 times probably in the first few months of my job, it's cheaper for me to just maintain this thing than it is for me to transform it. And so your transformation case or cloud migration case from a business case perspective can only be done in aggregate because if every, everyone is one-offing these decisions, they tend to bias back towards the legacy. Let me just invest a little bit more in the legacy. Uh, also, you need a strong technical foundation. Uh, network was our identity, uh, was our boundary. Um, we were not really networked for the cloud. We had some SaaS applications, uh, but we really hadn't designed or architected for what it's like to be running the, uh, the majority of your workloads outside your own data centers. Just a complete different shift. So we had to invest a lot in security and networking. Uh, and very little or capability, certainly very little technical capability, uh, but getting broad misunderstanding about what cloud is, what the technology can do. So just kind of low capability all around and the tremendous education challenge. So what did we do about all that? Well, we started with something that was really just kind of a, how do we get started? We called it the Cloud Center of Excellence. Um, we did anything from writing master legal contracts that people could use for SaaS providers uh, to answering questions to doing basic architecture governance. Um, we also started to build out the foundation for the security and the networking uh, for multiple cloud providers. Um, at that time, we didn't address some of the major challenges. We didn't address the billing. We didn't address migrations. Uh, and so we were 
I would say still testing the waters. We're doing what a lot of people are doing, a lot of proof of concept. Does it work? Let me play with this. Let me test this out. Uh, and so that's all well and good until you actually really need to do something at scale. And then you realize uh, kicking the tires, window shopping, whatever analogy you want to use, uh, at some point you have to stop POCing stuff and you just have to go. So that moves us to what we call the cloud program. Uh, that was our response to the leadership team saying, hey, why aren't you going faster? It's like, uh, okay, we can go faster. Here's what it takes to go faster. Uh, we need some funding, obviously, but we also need a different structure. Uh, so we stood up a program to change our organization. So we literally launched a new org design and we put people into that org design. Uh, we defined how our services would be managed and operated. Uh, we covered all the super fun stuff like internal billing, uh, which actually is, uh, in the early days, was 50% of the questions that I got. Uh, so nowadays, I think a successful presentation, and, and you guys can ask me this, but uh, internally is when nobody asks me about billing anymore. I'm pretty excited. Um, but we had to take care of all those kind of meat and potatoes of operations for a global enterprise. Uh, a lot of compliance, a lot of questions about, hey, if a partner is hosting this, what does this mean to import export compliance law, things like that. So we had to crank through all of that work. Um, and I would say, if I could draw a bar there, in transition to the last little cloud there, uh, we started running Agile. Uh, and I would say that was the major uh, accelerator for allowing us to get going. Did we do great at it? No. Uh, <laughs> but we started, and we got better, and we got better, and we got better the next time, and we're still getting better, and we get better every day. Um, so any of you, I would say one of the biggest keys, and it's in our critical success factors, is running Agile. We use SAFE, um, the scaled Agile framework. Uh, but just getting started, even though you know you don't know everything, um, standing up the teams to just start migrating applications, we did that in advance of having our master plan, because we like to have a master plan for everything. But it was never as right as we wanted it to be, because there's so much uncertainty and costs, uh, the changing nature of applications. If you're flipping something to PaaS services, it doesn't really look like the same application when you're finished. How do you cost all that stuff? So we had so many questions we couldn't answer. But while we were trying to answer all those, we just thought, let's go. Let's start learning and building our patterns. And so that was one of the best keys to success. So are we fully optimized? No, but we have product-based teams. We're moving quickly. Uh, we're moving 150 apps this year, uh, 500 next in terms of modernization, and then we're lifting and shifting the rest, and then we put them into a modernization queue after they get lifted out. So a little bit about what we learned. Um, it was 2012, I think, we had our very first Azure subscription. Um, but at that time, I would say two people uh, were using Azure. <laughs> and we lived in that, I would say, until about 2016. Uh, I think there was a room, I would say, it was about double the size, and we had one of our senior executives actually say, over my dead body, does our data go to the cloud? So we had a lot of uh, educational challenges. Also, it wasn't as well known. Um, there weren't that many stories about how cloud was secure how safe it was, how reliable it was. Uh, you didn't start to see those come into the marketplace in around 2015. Certainly by 2016, those stories, those anecdotes that our CEO or our CIO was hearing or reading, those became deafening uh, in terms of what other people were doing that helped kind of pressure us and change our approach. Uh, and certainly by late 2016, early 2017, people were saying, why aren't we going faster? Uh, so really quite a, a paradigm shift there in terms of the way our organization uh, felt about it and asked about it. Uh, and now, uh, it's my boss usually says, are your feet on fire? Uh, because we have so many people saying, I needed it yesterday. Can I have more faster, faster, faster? Uh, so where I used to get the, <laughs> I don't need to talk to you. Don't ever touch my stuff. Uh, now we get, please, can you help me? 
Um, and, and we have so many of those requests, we can't accommodate them all. Um, but some things actually turned out to be easier. I think our going in assumption, look, looking at our uh, infrastructure as a service workloads and our PaaS workloads, and when I talk about our situation, our 6,000 applications, roughly two thirds of those are vendor applications. So those were clear IaaS workloads. Uh, all of our custom developed applications we thought would be easy conversions to serverless PaaS services, and that is still our intent to convert as many of those as possible. Uh, and so when it came to a complicated, uh, some people have done very complicated analysis in terms of workload placement and things like that. For us, it was pretty easy. Uh, most of our custom applications are .NET, and so most of them are going uh, to PaaS services. And why was that easier? Uh, well, it actually turned out infrastructure automation, for any of you who caught Bill McKenzie's presentation, it's really hard. Uh, and we weren't prepared for it, and we didn't have the capability for it, and it just took longer than we thought. And so to actually drop the infrastructure completely was easier than we thought. Not to say it was, uh, we didn't have challenges, uh, but we were certainly able to move more applications that way quicker. Uh, also, like what I just mentioned, demand pull. Um, I don't have to go around with my hat begging people to do stuff anymore. Uh, so it's a flood of demand. So we have everyone raising their hand, can I go next, can I go next? So uh, certainly you have to prioritize all that and you have to plan that. Um, but it's a different story. Uh, large enterprise IT projects, many times you're competing for priorities. You have to use you know, more heavy handed metrics. You must do this. Uh, we don't have as much of that because uh, our CEO is very interested in digital transformation. Everybody understands how important this is, uh, and they want to go first, basically. So our challenge is all those people who want to go first is how do we order them? Uh, again, we weren't great at Agile when we started, um, but once you get started, it's not that hard. Uh, you get some teams going, get some coaches if you need them. Uh, again, one of our most important success factors. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are without that. Uh, also, getting started on the pipeline, not as hard as we thought. Uh, I don't have the architecture diagram. Again, if you pull it from one of the presentations yesterday, uh, our pipeline diagram, once we got that sorted out and understood what needed to be automated and when and how it was going to work, um, we could start moving stuff. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, and empowering developers is one of the most beautiful things I've seen. Uh, people that might not have touched their code, um, I'll just go on and do something else. Like, it's so easy now, I can make it better. And like, oh, so-and-so's doing something. Why are they doing that? Well, because they could, and it didn't take them very long. Uh, and so that's what we wanted to do, but to actually see it happening is very, very exciting uh, because sometimes you do these things in concept. Yes, we want to enable people. And then so when you see it actually happening where they don't have to go through some central organization and they don't have 15 tickets to get a piece of infrastructure, um, they just deploy what they need, um, it's really beautiful. Uh, what was harder than we thought? Um, I, every day, I kind of underestimate the culture change. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. Sometimes that you deliver the message 20 times, 25 times. Um, sometimes it still doesn't stick. And it doesn't stick because people don't want to hear the change message. Uh, and it's not always the infrastructure folks. Uh, sometimes it's developers. Sometimes it's finance people. Uh, they just have a lot of, there's a vested interest uh, in not changing. I want to do it the same way. Uh, so I'm not going to do anything about it until somebody tells me I absolutely, absolutely have to. Uh, and so the feedback I always get is, Vicki, your team needs to communicate more. <laughs> Like, okay, I have this budget, we have this many slides, we have all these communications meetings. Is it never, ever enough? Because this is such a big change. Uh, certainly for our IT folks, we're changing everything about the way they do things. Um, and, and that's been hard. And as I mentioned, infrastructure as code uh, has been a little bit more difficult, but part of that is the same as below it, security. Those two challenges were the same. And the reason I say that they were the same 
is because it's all manual. So imagine if you have a request and I just have tickets. I have 20 tickets that are created by this request and they go to 20 different teams. First of all, nobody can track all those. We don't really know where your request is. Uh, but also, if you need to automate that, you may have to go to 20 different teams and negotiate with those teams. Where's your script? Where's your API? You need to pull that work back. Uh, that is no small task. Uh, that was really much, much harder than we thought it would be. Uh, and for security, our challenge was, uh, I would say, even greater uh, because we'd made a significant investment in security uh, because of the, we'd really made a big investment in our cyber defense, but we made that investment at the time where we were securing really our network perimeter and not thinking about an identity perimeter uh, because it wasn't as large a priority for the corporation. This cyber defense was a greater priority than cloud. We kind of knew that at the time, but we also knew we'd have to unwind that, and that's been kind of a beast to unwind. Uh, and again, automation of all those manual processes, there were so many, I don't think any of us knew how many there were. Uh, and everybody who's operating one of those, um, even if it's, I've got a ticket, my job, I run the script, I'm gonna press a button to run the script, and then I'm gonna log back in, tell you I did it. Uh, so, uh, we had a lot of that, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, uh, but by the end of this, we'd like to have none of that uh, because it's just not necessary. Uh, but part of that is also the culture change of teaching people your value is not there. Your value is in writing a script to automate a new process and then a new one and a new one uh, and keeping our levels of incidents down. Your val that's not your value, is pressing that button and telling us that you did it. Uh, all right. So in terms of what's really, really, really important, uh, telling people that they have to automate has been hard. Uh, because a lot of times it's just like, oh, that, I, let me do it, just this one process. And so in some cases, um, I've just costed it out for them and said, this costs over the life of this, that one manual task is gonna cost $15 million if you, if you look at it properly. And so I will keep your task manual if you will give me $15 million. <laughs> um, and strangely, they don't wanna give me any money. Um, the next question is, well, I can't do it. It could take six months, it could take eight months. So we would usually say, we'll automate it for you, it's still yours, and then we can give it back to you. Um, and then we would usually get the response of, I don't, I don't want you doing my work, I'll figure it out. Uh, so, but again, that teaching people, what's always been acceptable, that has always been fine. It has always been fine to say, you need to wait eight months for this. And so to come and tell someone, sorry, that's not fine anymore, I'm not accepting your answer. Um, that's a little bit of a shock for them. Um, but it's critical. I mean, there's no way we can scale with all that manual stuff. No way. Uh, I already talked about Agile. Um, and I'm going to say it one more time. If you're not great at it, it doesn't matter. Just get started. Um, because it adjusts itself. Uh, one of my favorite other companies I visited, one of their teams said, we do Scrum Confl ban. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can adjust the process. We use the Scaled Agile framework, uh, but we're not that religious about it. There are some things we do really well, and there are some things we're less rigorous about. Uh, so you have to adjust it to your own processes. Uh, but if you don't do it, you can't move at the speed that's required. Uh, and so we have had dependent projects that were running waterfall. I mean, that's what we did at Chevron for years. We were very, very good at it. Uh, but none of them could meet our deliverable timelines, none of them. So I watched them fold last two years, one after the other, one after the other. And every one of them had to start running Agile uh, because they just couldn't, we can't afford. First of all, we can't afford you to take two months to come up with a set of three recommendations and then maybe whittle them down over another many months. Uh, one of the reasons is that your answer is going to be wrong anyway. Because technology is moving so fast that if you take a traditional project, your work product is actually obsolete by the time you deliver it. Uh, that's not a nice message for people to hear either, which is, hey, 
how's your project? Your deliverable is going to be obsolete when you get to it. Um, so the better way to do it is to have them come sit with some of the other teams, put them in your stand-ups, have them get going um, so that they can see, hey, this is a faster way to deliver. And I can change my deliverables to fit the pace of the technological change uh, that we're facing. I already mentioned strong network and security. But I will say, from a priority perspective, uh, certainly there were many reasons we chose to partner with Microsoft as our primary cloud provider. Uh, so I wouldn't say this was a major decision criteria, but it, I was relieved, like, phew, um, because double threading uh, all the networking and all, all the security, so putting out investments for multiple cloud providers uh, when you're getting the same services from them uh, didn't prove to be very economic for us. So we need our resources focused on one. Um, so that's why we're focused on Azure, um, and it's allowed us to move faster as well. So we're not trying to put all these resources to build out multiple platforms just in case we might need them. Uh, and I would say adjustments to our organization were critical. Because the culture change is so hard, you can't just have a few people working on this and not touch your organizational structure. Uh, that's a, probably a way to fail. Uh, so you've got to pull out the people who are willing to run fast, the people who are software engineers, the people who can really deliver, and you have to protect those people. So that's part of my main job, really, is to protect our Agile teams, uh, <laughs> shield them. So I take all the grief, all the politics, all the junk that comes my way so that they can keep working. Um, so if they're in an org structure uh, where the legacy processes keep intruding on their work, um, you're not going to survive. You're going to have to pull them out. Um, I, I don't want to say we got it right the first time. We do understand we'll need to continuously change. Uh, but we did uh, consciously change our organization with the understanding uh, that we could not leave some of these groups in the same group that were supporting the legacy technology. Do we think we'll merge them in another couple of years? Yeah, we probably will. Uh, but we need to give ourselves some room to grow and really incubate the capability. Uh, Build OC, okay, so that sounds really easy. <laughs> uh, it's super hard, um, but it's critical, so you can't give up. It's like the change management. You just have to keep working at it. You have to hire it. You have to build it. Uh, you have to do buddy systems. Um, that's one of the things we have working on our Agile teams is we have a team buddy that's assigned to the new team once we train him up and get him going so that we can help build capability. We have some of those people sitting over there. They've been awesome. Oh, thanks for asking, Jeffrey. OC, sorry, that's a Chevron term. Organizational capability, so skill um, and knowledge. Uh, and so, but that was across the board. So we have programs in terms of training, uh, but again, all the formal training is not as helpful as the hands-on training for the people who are doing the migrations. Uh, and then there's broader training that we need for our entire organization because the interest level is so high. And for people who are maybe not ready to actually do sandbox environments, help them learn, just to get them interested. Do you want to do this? Do you want to not? Uh, here's some things you can play with. We provide that type of training. Uh, and we also provide kind of more generic training. Uh, so part of our organization can understand where they might fit in the new world uh, for their role. And then lastly, services and commercialization. That gets back to the, can we internally bill it? But it's also, do we have the automated tooling uh, to manage ordering all the way through provisioning to billing? Uh, because that's, that's where we want to be. We don't want to have manual processes in the middle of that. And so if you don't address how all that works, um, it makes your life a lot, lot harder. And like I said, that's kind of the unfun part of cloud, but it's got to be done. Um, and so this is my plug for we're hiring developers, as many as we can. 
We'd love to see all of you work for Chevron, but I know some of you need to work for Microsoft. Um, but we're really excited about where we are. We're excited about the capabilities we're building. Uh, we're excited about the people who are coming to work for us. Uh, we have a lot of great work ahead of us. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jeffrey. All right, so now is Q&A. By the way, so the first Q is, uh, if somebody wants you to take you up on that, how do they uh, get in touch with you? I think my contact info is in the, the build. All right. Just, I'm on the site. You find me, and you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Excellent. So we have two microphones here. Um, I'll start off with a few questions, but then if you want to line up to the microphones to ask some, uh, feel free. Uh, so Victoria, you know, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, your journey with DevOps mirrors quite a few other companies that I've heard. The one part that I didn't hear was the, you know, you start off with the coalition of the willing and then you have the resistors and that <laughs> big, you know, uh, kind of cultural battle. Uh, but often what I hear from other companies is the, the folks, the first ones through the knot hole, the first ones that adopted, uh, really kind of have a transformative experience that they, uh, uh, they are delivering better business results and they feel that their career, they're having more fun at their job. Have, have you found that? Absolutely. Uh, so certainly I've heard from more than one person that this is the best job they've ever had at Chevron, uh, some of the people working on those teams. Uh, but again, those are also the people who are receiving the kudos from their business unit. Look what we built so quickly. Look what I did. Uh, so when it has nothing to do with me because they're all self-enabled, uh, that's the greatest part of all. And some of those people were also, I don't know if they were resistors, but I would call them skeptics. So some of the folks who are the biggest champions now were early skeptics of like, okay, I'm here, I'll listen to your training, um, I guess. And then literally within weeks saying, I gotta get my best people in here. We wanna do this. Yeah, that's one of the most yeah. exciting things is that when they, when they finally make that, that leap, they find out that, boy, they're delivering better results to their customers, the business improves, and they're just having fun. So let's go to our first question here. Uh, first off, good talk. Um, I can really relate to a lot of things you talked about. My company is only about 80 years old, and a lot of our legacy code is no joke, 50 or 60 years old, written in languages you've never heard of. How are Wanna you... Bet? How are you uh, dealing with some of those really old legacy applications and modernizing them when maybe the development team retired 20 years ago? So it depends on how old they are. Uh, in some cases, they are literally not worth touching. Uh, if somebody wrote it 20 years ago and it's still running, uh, then we would leave it be and not modernize it. Otherwise, you probably have to rewrite it. Okay, thank uh, you. Yeah. By the way, there's a common pattern here, and if you're not familiar with it, it's worth getting in focus. It's called the strangler pattern, right? So in design patterns, it's the strangler. And what you do is you've got a legacy system and you want to get rid of it. So what you do is instead of do not start from scratch and rewrite the whole thing, that's death. What you do is you put something in front of it and then have all the systems talk to that thing in front of it. Now the first implementation of the thing in front just calls the back end. But then step by step, you make that a thicker and thicker layer until eventually you strangle the back end. That's, that's the pattern, that's the best practice. Yeah, that's pretty much what we've been doing. Thank yeah. you. By the way, what was the, what was the language? Give it, give it up. <laughs> uh, one for example, Rocky Mountain Basic. Okay, you went on that one. <laughs> Anyone? Which one? Rocky Mountain Basic, no, anyone? Anyone? Anybody? No, no. Yeah, it was uh, HP's implementation of Basic on HP UX. Wow, wow. <laughs> I wrote I wrote the first true Mumps compiler, so I was hoping you were going to say Mumps. Mumps. So I, I had a question about your uh, your program managers and your you know your PMO. So uh, we're going down the same path you guys did, and. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. They don't know quite what to make of all this. They're used to being able to have their calendars and their, power, you know, and their the other project files, and they're just going right along. And we're doing agile, you know, we're getting things out in iterations, but we can't give them a date. Like we, that feature, we don't have a date for that feature. It's done when we get there, right? Uh, do you have any, um, in, you know, anything you could share about 
that? I mean, do, I'm sure you went through something like that. Do you I, have some insights into that? that I'm should? sure I have that conversation every day of my <laughs> life. Of, Why don't you know the answer to that? Um, so part of it is you do have to have an overall plan. So it doesn't matter, running Agile doesn't get you away from that. You should know what your end goal is, whether it's financial, process-oriented, number of applications, so we have that. So we know where we're, what we're driving towards. Uh, and so you have to put markers along the way. Can I measure this? Can I measure that? Uh, and what we've had to train our leadership on, and you know, if you're using some sort of classic waterfall methodology, is because we have a phase gating methodology. And so our assumptions when we were doing waterfall would be my estimate on cost and schedule is going to be really tight by this phase in time. And so what we've done is saying, it's just not going to be that tight. My range of uncertainty is greater. And so here's a greater range of uncertainty that they're work you're working in. And so I'm not going to give you that, but I'm going to give you this range and this is where we're driving. And then they, then they back off a little bit and say, okay, uh, but but literally opening up that range of uncertainty and making that visible in terms of cost uh, and schedule and deliverables so that they can see, okay, these people are not off the hook from an accountability perspective, uh, but we also can't be too prescriptive about what they deliver and when they do it. Does that help? Thank you. Hi. Uh, great talk, by the way, very inspiring. My question is around data. So one of the things that, that I struggle with figuring out is uh, the, the data gravity. Uh, we have all our legacy systems uh, on-premises in, in IBM data centers. And well, we are building everything new in cloud. However, we need access to that data. And there's multiple layers in this challenge. One thing is just uh, the technical challenges. And then we also have uh, probably more ownership challenges, so letting go and, and sharing your data with cloud applications. So have you any insights in this area to share? Uh, I might ask Brian to come up here and talk a little bit mm -hmm. about analytics, but uh, certainly integration with our data uh, and also some very, very old uh, <laughs> systems of record basically that are, are literally huge. Uh, but we've also found as we move out some of the ancillary systems that we're not as tightly coupled as we thought. So as you're building um, your migration plan, some things that connect back to an on-prem data store, you don't have to manage moving everything all at once. There is a way to pick it apart. And so we looked at some of those clusters in terms of how we do that uh, versus trying to over plan and like take everything and every integration point and move it all at the same time. Uh, but you will have to do some de-architecting as you go. Uh, and we're also using the opportunity if we can use change some of our classical classic point-to-point -point interfaces uh, to APIs as we do that, we want to look for those opportunities. But the data is absolutely a tough challenge. Uh, in some cases, like you said, it is uh, easier uh, to build new in the cloud, let people migrate to that over time, and then kind of let your legacy shrink. But I wanted to get right, do you want to say anything about what we're doing on the analytics front in terms of data? So on the analytics side of the house, you know, we are moving uh, one, their big data lake that they have on premises into uh, the cloud. Um, so I would say that there are certain applications that we can move the data, but then others are a little bit more difficult. So like in the high performance computing world, right, where you've got workflows and those workflows have large, very large data sets, seismic data sets that need to move between that workflow. Well, an application like that, it's very difficult to move just a piece of it to the cloud and have the data on premises because it just doesn't work. And so you have to try to take the applications like that in whole and move them along with the data or else you can't have a kind of a hybrid connected environment. But from an analytics perspective, everything from a data lake that they've got on premises today is moving into Azure. High performance computing, we're trying to look for workflows that are a little bit uh, smaller, the data sets are a little smaller, and try to move those in, in whole 
into the cloud. And then as we work on longer term solutions for the seismic side of the house, um, trying to figure out how, again, we, we can move all of it, right? So I don't know if that kind of answers your question or provides any insight into what we're doing there. Can I uh, offer a slightly different perspective? So we recently had a reorganization, and now I'm the, also in charge of uh, Azure Storage, which I know absolutely nothing about. But I've been coming up to speed, and there's some amazing stuff. Have anybody heard about Avere? Anybody? Right. It's a watch this space uh, area, right? So what I'm going to tell you, I don't think is available right now, but here's what's on, what's coming. So Avere was a storage company, and what they did was they said, hey, there's a whole bunch of NASs out there uh, that are relatively slow. So what they did was they built a caching layer. It was all SSDs, and what you did was you had all your clients talk to it, and then it would front end all the different NASs. Incredible uh, performance increase. So much so that people said, hey, you mask latency. We're going to take your device and we're going to uh, put it to mirror in, in all of our uh, branch offices. So now the branches are there. They talk to the local Avir uh, device and it talks to remote you know, uh, storage servers and everybody thought that they had a local storage service. Fantastic. So next stage, oh, well, wait a second. So if I have this caching layer and it uh, back ends to a large capacity and, and makes up for latency, why don't I do that to the cloud? Okay, and so that's what they do. Now that you can talk to this thing and it can consume cloud storage where cloud storage is cheaper and effectively infinite. Now here's where it gets interesting. So then they said, hey, we can also do this as a virtual appliance. So as a virtual appliance, they get a, a VM that has SSD, and then you talk to that, and then it talks to your blob stores, and then they're doing the work to be able to say, and now it can also, you t again, you're in the cloud, you talk to this virtual appliance, they do the plumbing to talk to your local storage area networks. Now, why is this exciting? This is exciting and used extensively by the movie industry. The movie industry, their movie is their IP. They have a you know, high degree of security around that. They want to keep that, uh, that on premises. So what they do is they uh, do only one frame at a time up in the cloud. They process it in the cloud, and then they write it all back local storage. Anyway, so the severe, the, the patterns that you can uh, do on-premises to the cloud, cloud on-premises is being expanded with this new Avere acquisition. So watch that space. I, we might have some talks about it at, at Build here. If, if not, definitely uh, watch it at Ignite. Thank you. Sorry, I just had to get in there. I'm so excited. Now you mentioned that uh, you had a culture of checking and rechecking and also mentioned that uh, Automation is very key to your success. Did you automate your software QA to any great extent? And if so, how did you do it? Uh, I would say automating that is one of our things to do. So we're doing a little bit of that. But that is one of our opportunity areas. We want to have full automation there. Um, so we're just, we have partial, I would say. OK, we'll do two more here, and then do you, and then the third one there. Hi, I also work for an oil and gas company, so I kind of understand some of the cultural baggage that can come with some of that. And so I, when I think of agile transformation, a lot of people coming from a, a more traditional culture, um, they're looking for a methodology. They're looking for a process. Give me the steps and I'll just do the steps, right? But really, agile transformation is more about changing the way you think. And it's, 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 and, and people are typically resistant to it because uh, they don't know any better. They've never seen anything else. And so what, what are some things that you can speak to about how to help people change their mind so they're not, they're not focused on doing a new process and a new methodology, but they're actually learning a new way to work? Uh, so some things that have helped us along uh, is getting agile coaches. So not carrying the full burden of that. Uh, so helping them guide you through the process, especially if you're new at it. Uh, certainly when I find someone who I'm always so interested, OK, that hurt person has heard that story 10 times. And today it clicked. I'm always interested in, in what made the brain click that day. Um, 
But I think also taking people and actually putting them in the process. So this is what good looks like. I could, I can talk at them for hours. It's nowhere near as powerful as having them sit with some of those teams. So I don't have to tell them what it looks like. They see and feel what it looks like. Uh, and if you're just starting and you don't have any of that, take them to another company where people are running like full on DevOps and just have them sit with them. Uh, so that they can see this is how it works. Uh, you know, I've had people sit with security teams at other companies, watch them run agile meetings, all sorts of things like that, just so that they could get the idea of this, this isn't your normal day. Uh, certainly when we're onboarding people, we do tell them. <laughs> all that other stuff you do, random meetings for random projects, random requests for, from your management to do this, do that. I was like, we don't do any of that. Here's where your work comes from. Here's how you work it. So part of that is actually a huge benefit to the people working Agile because it's, it's a, at its simplest, it's a throughput management system for, for human work, right? So um, then, wow. I don't have all these extra demands. I can actually commit to what I need to do and then I can do it. And if somebody else will take all that extra burden off my shoulders. So that's the other thing is you have to take that burden away from those people. If you're free to work in an agile team, I'm gonna protect you from all those random one-off requests uh, that people working in the old way will maybe still ask of you. Victoria, a lot of people uh, in enterprises that have uh, been successful adopting DevOps have talked about Gene Kim's book, The Phoenix Project, as their gateway drug to DevOps. And I was wondering whether or not uh, you found that a useful resource? Uh, well, certainly when we were trying to learn, we all read that uh, and many other books as well. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure we found a lot of ourselves in that book. So mm -hmm. it resonated in terms of, oh, okay, I recognize myself. I, I look a little bit like that. Um, but I think, uh, so it was just a way to understand, a way to recognize that this challenge is universal in terms of um, the problems that we face. I think the people who had, because that's based in Lean Sigma, so people who have a background in Lean Sigma who really get the factory concept, yeah. they really, really got it. Uh, some other folks, not so much. Uh, because part of our biggest challenge is that idea. So I, literally, a factory floor, I'm building a machine that builds machines. Uh, and so that's much more efficient than you building a one-off and a one-off and a one-off. Uh, but unless they worked in the process and it's delivered those machines for them, they really don't understand it. Yeah, it's one thing I've found as you, as you engage in DevOps, you will really, it's useful to realize that there are two communities talking, saying similar things, but really have different focus and you want to pick your community. So the first is the startups, the internet companies who have no, who have nothing and then do this from the scratch. They're great, they're awesome, but it's not really the same lessons that, and, and path that a company that has existing assets needs to take to, to, go, to embrace DevOps. And uh, Gene Kim actually has a conference called DevOps Enterprise because it's focused in on the lessons of those people. And it's a, a bunch of his videos uh, from that conference are on YouTube, so I encourage you to take a look at those if that's your path. So a lot of what we do as well is just go do something, right? So some teams like around, we have a Tiger team that, which is an agile based team, but the methodology that we're using is just build something, get something out from an MVP perspective, right? Let's not sit here and talk for days around how to architect ADLS or let's just go and build and get something out there and iterate on it. And so um, that's been very successful. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for sharing this morning. Uh, my company has a lot of internal infrastructure, so for moving to the cloud, some of our system admins, of course, are nervous. <laughs> so, I mean, how did you overcome that with teaching them to learn new skills and overcome that resistance to change? And then my next question is, we're very cost-centered at our company. Uh, have you had any real ROI uh, information to say, hey, this is saving us money in the long run. So yes, we do have a, 
a very large and complicated business model uh, because we have savings in a number of different places. We get savings from automation. Uh, we get savings from infrastructure cost avoidance or life cycling out. And so we. Oh, not to interrupt, but how are you deriving those metrics? Um, well, if we no, take. Don't ask me that. <laughs> all right, well. If I don't hit it when I'm done, ask me again, I'll, I'll try to hit it. So um, certainly there's known costs. So it is easy to take your infrastructure costs, cost that with cloud, cost the pro project so that you have kind of a bump in your spend to execute migrations, and then a reduction in your infrastructure costs uh, in your outer years. So that should not be too difficult. What was harder for us to cost is hey, I think I'll have some savings, automation-based savings. So we have some squishier estimates, and we're a conservative company. We don't like to do that. So most of our estimates are, are low-balled on the infrastructure costs. But when I say infrastructure, uh, you can avoid uh, any data center costs or infrastructure repurchase. So um, if, you do, if you get your timing right, you can gather up all your infrastructure repurchase, and instead of repurchase, um, that's the point where you move to the cloud. And so and by shedding your infrastructure costs, that's why we went to PaaS, uh, you can, if you're careful about it, you can probably self-fund your migrations. Uh, but certainly data center, our legacy data centers were just coming, they were becoming too expensive to run. We just couldn't afford to run them anymore, not with all the manual processes that we had. I mean, we really view this as an imperative. Um, and as for, the, as for the server admins, uh, <laughs> some of them are still nervous. Uh, I, I would be lying if I said they weren't. However, um, we're shrinking. So we're shrinking our legacy footprint. Uh, so by providing a lot of training opportunities, we're just shifting the nature of the work that we do. Um, we haven't had any, you know, nobody's lost a job or anything like that. We are reskilling people where we can. Uh, some people are not interested in that. We have some awesome use cases. Somebody says, I want to run this ERP infrastructure for the next three years and then I'm going to retire. That's fantastic. Uh, because we need that job done and we need somebody to do it. Uh, but we also need people to be honest about what they will and will not do. Uh, so um, we've been pretty honest about what infrastructure as code looks like. Infrastructure management looks more like software engineering than server administration. That can be a hard thing for them to hear. Um, but we also carved out opportunities for people to say, this isn't even your job. We're going to give you some protection or relief, bring in some backfill labor to do your job, so give you a chance to learn. Try this out. See if you can do it. You might be the new person who manages this area if you, if you are successful. So we gave a lot of people who had the willingness, the desire to learn, we gave them some opportunities to see what they could do. And I would say they all stepped up. You know, I've found that when you have a big change like this, a transformational change, uh, it's very e these things are super hard. And, you know, getting people through that knot hole, over the hurdle, uh, it can be very difficult. One thing that helps if you're the person trying to make that change, and this is going to be a little controversial, but just recognize not everybody's going to make it. And it's not your responsibility to get 100% of the people over the the threshold. And you might need to hire new talent to bring the company where it needs to be. And it's odd, but once you realize that, like not everybody's going to make it, you wish that you want to give people lots of opportunities, want to get some stuff, etc. But it might just be that their next play needs to be somewhere else, and then it's easier to make that transition. At least it's easier to, to go through the struggles uh, in making that transition. Yeah, and just one more thing to add on that. It's when you show them, this is what I need you to do, uh, you can get that self-selection process going a lot faster than if you're talking about it and they really don't understand. It's like, no, I need you to learn the scripting language. This is what it looks like. Sit with this person and watch it. Uh, you can get those decisions faster of, yes, I want to do this and I'm interested. I'll take this training. I'll take the certification or no thanks. Can we talk about a different opportunity for me? So when you're making a, 
a transition from a traditional waterfall model to safe agile. You have all of these roles and responsibilities uh, that people are used to, and you have positions that never existed before. You have release train engineer, you have different roles for a uh, product owner and product manager and scrum master. So can you uh, describe how you manage that, trend, that, that your organizational ch has to change? How did you manage that organization change? And also, how did you get senior management buy-in to create and fund these positions that had never existed before in your organization? Well, I'd say we're, we're still in that transition. Uh, and I laugh because, I mean, I think people are always like, what? What's a release train engineer? What are you talking about? I don't even know what that is. So uh, certainly there are key leaders where we said, can you please go to this training? It's really important that you can support this. Uh, we also have a central organization within Chevron uh, that kind of carries the agile message and trains scrum masters and, and helps provide them our, our, is that org as mature as we want it? No, it isn't, but we're kind of tr trying to grow that capability. Um, but I would say the coolest thing is in terms of getting management buy-in, um, we got some, we got enough, and once we started moving and we were moving faster than everyone else, the buy-in just came. Like it, it was like a flood. Please, can you teach my organization? I want this. Can you set up a team for this? Can I have that? Um, because you literally see the power of the speed of delivery speaks for itself. Uh, and then you don't need much of a change management program. You just need to publish your results. So do you now have, a, a, does, your HR uh, does your HR organization now have the ability to hire in, uh, into positions that are that the end roles that are directly for your safe agile process uh, I would say we concentrated not uh, I think we have a couple roles that fit the safe framework uh, but as part of our transformation we did have our HR organization literally go through all our roles and add new ones and change our, our definitions uh, so that we could, and we even changed some of our hiring practices. So we had a very large HR study to figure out how we would do cloud and digital transformation. Uh, and they've been a great partner in that. But you're bringing up a great point. You know, if you're coming to this conference, by and large, you're one of two categories. You either work for a company whose business is primarily software, or you work for a company whose primary business is not software, but for whom software is becoming an increasingly important component. If you work for one of those second type of companies, um, you, need, you are in competition for software talent. You need to figure out how you are gonna compete against the likes of Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Amazon for the top software talent. So you need to be working with your HR department to f realize that, hey, we have new career tracks that are required. You need to take a look at your compensation. Are you compensating uh, people according to industry norms? Are you giving them the right opportunities, the right access to, for them to develop their skills? I've worked in companies doing software where software was not the primary business, and I've worked for companies where it was their primary business, and there is a difference. And going forward, I think there, will, there needs to be less and less of a difference. Any more questions? Got time? Um, if I don't have to get up. <laughs> okay, we'll repeat the question. Okay, so, uh, or, if you stand up, I can hand you this mic. You just gotta get in front of the speakers or yeah, it's gonna be a bad day. I will hold it for you. <laughs> Okay, so it seems like um, at some point there was a snowball effect where instead of you having to go out, people started coming to you. How long did that take to happen? Two years of some pretty we're, we're slogging through mud. Two years of slogging through mud is how I would describe it. Stand up. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we're transcribing this, so. Uh, okay. So, as uh, developers for the DoD, Adam and I are working basically from the grassroots, trying to get implement DevOps, and all your pain points. We were over here laughing at because they are struggles we go through every day right now. 
And I just wanted to comment on that because okay. I know you saw us over here kind of just <laughs> laughing. And it was, uh, it was a great talk. Uh, it's been a great conference so far, so thank you. Okay. By the way, uh, as you embark on DevOps, you know, there's somebody was asking about cost recovering, cost savings, et cetera. Uh, that's all great stuff, and there's a, there's a there there, but really it is this business effectivity that helps get people over the hur hurdle for DevOps, right? Because with the cost savings, it's like, well, is that a valid formula, and what about the hidden costs, and blah, blah, blah. And people can balk, and well, any transition, there's risk, et cetera. But typically, the folks that get through the knothole of like, man, we gotta change, is when they've had some fa business failure. Like, hey, we had this project, and it didn't deliver on time. Or we're getting our butts handed to us in this area as the competition are moving faster. Those things, you know, that, that there's some business imperative, those you find people willing to make change, right? Often failure is the biggest motivator for change. So you find something where there's some dissatisfaction. We need to make progress here. Then you find the coalition of the willing, right? Hey, if you're not on board, that's fine. Go do something else. We want people who are in. And then you, you, as he says, don't go spend you know, a bunch of time becoming a, a 400 level expert in DevOps. I think reading the DevOps book, definitely worthwhile, but just do it. Just like understand the principles. We wanna move fast and iterate quickly and do it and then learn. And as you do that, then start to educate yourself. And that manufactures success and then that grows and grows and grows. So I, I go to this DevOps conference, and basically that story, that pattern was told across industries over and over again. And then the next year, I see the same person just telling essentially the same story, except this year was different, because last year they were a manager of something, and this year they're the director of something. And then the third year I come back, and this person's telling essentially the same story, and now they're the vice president of something. So you start small, grow, and scale up. And by the way, at some point, when you've had enough a sequence of these successes, that's where it, you can bring executive sponsorship in to say, okay, now let's figure out how to do it en masse. It is a mistake, it is a mistake to try and go from where you are to um, universal DevOps. You'll fail and it'll put back your effort by years. So you wanna start small, get some success, grow, get a couple iterations, and then figure out how to go big in my opinion. So you mentioned... I'm shorter than average. Um, so you mentioned that, uh, that you sort of customize the Agile process, and um, I've, I don't, I've, I mean, I've never talked to anybody who hasn't, um, but in your experience, what are some of the key pieces of Agile? Like, what are some of the things that pretty much any implementation of this process has to do? Uh, well, certainly running in the common release train is, is critical to map the dependencies across the teams. We couldn't survive without that. That's what that dependency working in the program increment gives us the ability to move stories around, move work around, and hit those dependencies and move as fast as we can. Uh, architecture runway, extremely important. Uh, we have a process, uh, a waterfall-based process, which was like, we'd go architecture review, architecture review, and so we have all these decisions. It could take two years to work through that. Uh, so when we get all that concentrated in one week, make those decisions as fast as we can, make them visible and escalate them up, that has also been extremely important. Uh, and then I would say the basic nuts and bolts of the process. I mean, people have to understand stand up and, and backlog and, and how to work differently and, and have the team members support them in that. Cool, thanks. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I'm trying to boil it down to just one. This is my favorite one. I've never got an answer to it. So I've been doing that drive for about three years. Before that, it was rational, unified process before that was kind of probably deep waterfall. So my question is how much documentation is appropriate? Because we prefer working software to a good document or thorough documentation. But um, I get user stories which is 
make it like the old system because we were transforming a desktop application into a web one and we just get one line make it like the old system and then how can you derive uh, a good testing strategy from that without going reverse engineering the code uh, who's supposed to do that <laughs> so how much is i mean in a year's time no one's going to remember what they coded so where's the documentation and when I started, we had a really good coach three years ago. Um, his name is Henry Dittmer, and he said, you're going to be almost laughing. Well, that hasn't really happened yet. And he said, Agile is very difficult to master and requires a lot more discipline because you don't have all these heavy duty processes. So given all of that, how much documentation is the right amount? Well, I know why you've never gotten an answer. It's pretty much an impossible question. Because yeah, I guess The deliverable is. dictates it to you. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say we get it wrong most of mm -hmm. the time. Uh, in, in our spirit of moving quickly, I would say we have underdocumented in some cases where, mm -hmm. where we need that. Uh, and I, I would say, if you're earlier in your journey, you probably need more, and some of that's to comfort the rest of your organization that's used to seeing some of this stuff. Uh, but at least if you've got it all online and it's inter interchangeable and you're not putting actual like Word documents or paper documents somewhere, uh, keep it in, the, in your systems of record, keep it as agile as possible and keep it as modular as possible. Uh, that's certainly the best way to go so that you can keep it fresh because um, anybody who's written more than 10 pages, it's pretty much worthless mm -hmm. uh, because it's obsolete tomorrow. Uh, and so I guess my answer is modular systems where people can come back and change it very, very quickly. Just I just needed to change a small piece. Yeah. Um, we try and keep everything in one place. In the user story, we use Jira. Um, but I, I, uh, actually, I do have one more question is when you're actually writing the code, I understand that you have conversations as you go along, but you have to write those conversations down. And that's something that doesn't happen much. That's a problem, I think. I, I agree. We're looking forward to some of that technology we saw yesterday where we can capture yeah. the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you need a mind reader. <laughs> But one of the other answers for documentation is to replace documentation with tests. Right. right. Ultimately, where you'd like to get to is a world where you say, developers, you can make any change you want. As l at, when you're done, when you check it in, we're going to run these tests. And if it's green, we push to production. And if it's not green, we don't. We back out your change. And then if you, something goes to production and you didn't like something that happened, then the answer is, add another test. So tests are very precise. They say yes, they say no. When someone writes something down, what do they really mean? And is, is, are we all speaking the same language? I mean, literally English? And is that your first language? And do you write precisely or do you write verbose? Tests are nice and precise. It doesn't do everything, but the degree to which you can use tests instead of documentation, you're much better off. I think that's a great answer. Um, thank you for that. I just inherited some software and it's got 4% coverage and I've been told it should be 75 and why isn't it there yet? <laughs> From the person who had that software for five years before me. <laughs> anyway, thank you. I'm an engineer in, uh, in the oil and gas business and I have one simple question. Do you get your engineers in Chevron to adopt Agile? You are talking about DevOps but the same principles could be adopted by the engineering teams in Chevron. Are you doing that? Uh, we are doing that in pockets uh, because we're seeing uh, we're, we're seeing the benefit of that. So I would say there's no broad adoption across all the engineering teams, uh, but there are some teams that do it very, very well. Uh, and actually, they understand uh, probably uh, the Gene Kim more because they, most of them had a very, very strong grounding in Lean Sigma. And so once you relate it to that, uh, they understand it very, very well. Uh, but we don't have broad adoption across, uh, but I think as part of our digital transformation, we'll be pushing out into engineering. Thanks. Hello, hello. Yes, I'm uh, actually I'm, I'm a uh, technical person, not, uh, not, a, not a part of the management side, but I'm going to ask more about the resource. 
So you are hiring talents, right? Uh, part of the resource augmentation of your company when it comes to the development team. My question is that how did you handle the situation when you think you hired the wrong person? Okay, and then how did you able to keep the high profile of the existing people in your company? I'm putting my, myself as part of that. Uh, for example, I'm an SME on this product. And then you hired a new person, and you think you hired the wrong person, and you want to, to remove this person from that team, for example. And then my third question is that, what did you do in the management side in order for you to protect them, to make them more productive all throughout this process of the development, for, for them to be able to, 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 to deliver the solution as expected? Okay, so let me make sure I, I understand it's a your very question. Tough question yeah. Which is, what if you hire the wrong person? Yes. And then, how do you keep your existing employees uh, in high uh, morale? Mo yeah. motiv motivated. Yeah. Okay, and the other one was, how do you keep the management level productive in yes. this kind of a transformation? Yep. And what are the actions that you did you do in your side for them to protect these people ah. from okay. disturbance all throughout this? Uh, development process. Okay. Great well, the last one, there's no magic to that. I stand in front of the bus and get run over 20 times a day to protect those people. Um, on the first one, uh, there's an easy and a hard answer. Uh, so when we have people on the teams, if we have um, partner labor, uh, contractors, contract engineers coming in, we have a two sprint rule on the team. Uh, we we'll give you a little bit of a grace period, but if you're not working out, we say, hey, thanks very much. Um, we'll, we'll catch you on another project. Uh, now that's really easy to do if somebody's contracting for you. You can't do that with a full-time employee. You can, however, do that if you borrow that person, you can go back to their management and say, hey, we did this as, as a development opportunity for your person. We gave them a couple of sprints. Uh, it's not working out. So if they want to develop more in this skill, I'm giving them back to you, and you're gonna to have to have a more comprehensive learning plan for them, and I suggest maybe another role. That doesn't always work, <laughs> not always. Sometimes we have to uh, work with what we have, then we might get somebody, a buddy, extra coaching. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's the last option for what you all know is if you've made an error and you're hiring and you don't have a good fit with someone. Um, and in terms of morale, uh, what we've done is try to provide a lot of opportunities for the people who are interested uh, because in a lot of cases they're not going to have the skill but if they have the aptitude and the desire uh, we give them a shot it doesn't mean they get forgiveness forever to not perform but we give them a chance uh, and so we want we communicate those opportunities a lot and let them know uh, and again where we still need reliable legacy operations, we let them know that that's very, very important to our company as well. Uh, so we're not saying it's not important. We're just saying for a set period of time, we're gonna run that and then we're not gonna run that anymore and they understand that and then they will move off and do something else. Uh, so I don't wanna say it isn't a challenge because it is, uh, but certainly we communicate uh, a lot of the retrading opportunities and we do that day in and day out. Uh, and again, on the management side, um, I would say that's my primary job is to make sure I have management alignment so that we have developers developing. Uh, that's not their job to take some of those issues. They didn't take those jobs because they wanted to take those issues. Uh, and so there is a, a, a lot of work to make sure everything lines up. But once you get that, the beauty that comes out of the other end in terms of the fast delivery of capability that buys you uh, extra management buy-in. Uh, so it's just the gift that keeps paying uh, and then you get that buy-in all by itself. Excellent, we got time for one last question. I was just gonna, I was just gonna add uh, the question about documentation. So, and this may not work for everyone, but uh, I brought Agile into my company and we work in the uh, power distribution uh, or we actually build software for power distribution uh, people. And I actually uh, put a documentation person on every Agile team, and sometimes that person splits multiple teams, um, but they're not necessarily the technical person, but they stand in every stand-up or scrum, 
And then they kind of have the ability to go ask questions and they actually write a lot of the documentation. My developers write it too, but if they don't understand it, then they can go ask and add. And so for me, it was a lower cost person to add to the team that could ensure the documentation was understood better. And the users of our software, I would also say, are you know not high tech people. And so it kind of helped us get documentation to the customers as well. So that's just, that's how we solve that problem. That's great. That's a great observation. Hey, this has been a fantastic session. What a great Q&A, huh? Let's give it up for Victoria and Ryan.